Stanford University. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Gary Segura. I'm a professor of political science. I am the director of the Institute on the Politics of Inequality, Race, and Ethnicity at Stanford and the co-director of the Stanford Center for American Democracy. And I want to welcome you to the Stanford Symposium on Marriage Equality. Uh, we are in the midst of a two-day consideration of two landmark Supreme Court cases and the underlying social, political, and legal issue uh, on which those two cases revolved. Tonight, uh, I am joined by a distinguished panel of plaintiffs, of attorneys, of experts, uh, who are going to offer some of their insights on the two cases. Before we begin, I want to start by recognizing um, my partner in organizing this event and in organizing this weekend, and that's Professor Jane Schachter from the Stanford Law School. Jane. I also want to acknowledge that the event is being um, co-sponsored by the Office of the Provost. Uh, who were very generous in their support, the School of Law, the School of Humanities and Sciences, the Center for American Democracy, the Office of the Vice Provost for Graduate Education, the Department of Political Science, INSPIRES, the Clayman Institute for Gender Research, the Center for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity, and the Program in Feminist, Gender, and Sexuality Studies. And we are deeply appreciative of the many contributions that we received around campus. So tonight, I'm joined by a distinguished panel uh, and some guests of honor. And I'm going to start with the panel, and I'll introduce each uh, person to you. Uh, and then I'll introduce our guests of honor. And, uh, and really, they'll be the show tonight, and they'll share with you uh, their insights um, from uh, the, the two cases and from the events that led up to them uh, and what it all uh, potentially means. So I start with the, the person uh, closest to me on the table, and that is Jeremy Goldman. Jeremy is a partner in the Oakland offices of Boyce, Schiller, and Flexner. He served as second chair to David Boyce during the Proposition 8 trial and was responsible for the day-to-day -day management of the litigation, heading the team of lawyers from that firm, from the firm's offices all around the country. Uh, he's a commercial litigator that represents clients in federal and state court. After graduating from Yale Law School in 2001, Mr. Goldman clerked for the Honorable Rosemary Barquette on the United States Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit. He holds a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science and Philosophy from the University of Toronto and completed a PhD in Political Science at Princeton University and then foolishly chose uh, to leave Political Science and enter, enter the legal profession. I will also say on a personal note that uh, Jeremy's job uh, during the Prop 8 trial was to protect me and he did a fine job of that. I'm deeply appreciative of that. So please welcome Jeremy <laughs> Goldman. Sitting next to Jeremy is Theony Evangelis. Uh, she is an appellate and general litigation partner in the Los Angeles office of Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher. She specializes in appellate and constitutional law, class action, and media and entertainment disputes. Theony served as a law clerk to Justice Sandra Day O'Connor on the United States Supreme Court before joining Gibson Dunn. She served as counsel to the plaintiffs in Hollingsworth v. Perry, which we're talking about tonight. Um, and she's been named by the Daily Journal as one of the top 20 lawyers under 40 in California. Uh, Theony took care of me during the trial, so I appreciate her for that as well. Please join me in welcoming Theony Evangelos. <laughs> Seated next to Theony is Chad Hunter Griffin. He is the president of the Human Rights Campaign, the largest LGBT organization in the United States. He has spent his career taking on entrenched, well-financed interests like big tobacco, big oil in the far right, and shaped national policy debates around equal rights, clean energy, universal health care, and stem cell research. Griffin is the founding board member of the American Foundation for Equal Rights, which was the sole sponsor of the Proposition 8 lawsuit, and he was responsible for recruiting Ted Olson and David Boies to successfully argue the case. He's a veteran of the Clinton White House and a native of Arkansas. Please welcome Chad Griffin. Moving to the opposite end of the table, my colleague uh, Pam Carlin, the Kenneth and Harl Montgomery Professor of Public Interest Law at, the, at Stanford, co-directs the Supreme Court Litigation Clinic. The clinic was co-counsel for Edith Windsor in the United States versus Windsor this year, 
where the Supreme Court held that the Section 3 of the Defensive Marriage Act was unconstitutional. Her scholarship focuses on constitutional law and civil rights. Among her articles are several discussing marriage equality, including, quote, the gay and the angry, the Supreme Court, and the battle surrounding same-sex marriage. Please join me in welcoming Pam Carlin. The final member of our panel, before we get to the guests of honor, is Natalie Renta. Natalie is from San Juan, Puerto Rico, and attended undergraduate at Harvard University. She is currently in her second year at Stanford Law School, and she serves as one of the co-presidents of Outlaw, Stanford's law, Stanford Law's LGBT student organization. Welcome. And now for our guests of honor. It is difficult to communicate to an audience who has not participated in a federal court trial the degree of scrutiny, the degree of vulnerability, uh, the degree of courage that's involved in taking on the United States government and taking on the government of California and doing so under the watchful eye of basically everyone in the country. Two couples stepped forward to help the American Foundation for Equal Rights file suit against Proposition 8. So it is my distinct honor to introduce the plaintiffs from what was originally Perry versus Schwarzenegger and what will go down in history as Hollingsworth v. Perry, Chris Perry and Sandy Steer, Jeff Zerillo and Paul Katami. Now you might notice that's everyone at the table, but last but not least, we have another guest who's going to join us via video link. Hi there. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, one person had the courage to sue the United States government to have Section 3 of the Defense of Marriage Act declared unconstitutional. Please welcome Ms. Edie Windsor. Hi there, can you hear us? So can you hear us? He said, can you hear him? I, I'm not, not really, I hear your voice, but, I, but it's not, I can't hear the words. So what I'm going to do is ask Alexia to repeat the questions for me. Well, I'll be translating. That's good. <laughs> we're gonna do our best to make sure we're understood, but first we would like to hear from you. Can you tell us how you found yourself suing the United States of America over the Defense of Marriage Act? How did you find yourself suing the United States of America over the Defense of Marriage Act? Uh, well, uh, quite a question. Well, uh, actually, uh, I was, dis I did expect, I did not expect that there would be any alleviation of, of things like estate tax. Uh, I was shocked at the amounts, I, I must say. But uh, I, I, felt, I felt very strongly, well, first of all, I was sick immediately after the had died. I had a heart attack characterized as a broken heart syndrome. So I was sick and I was anguished and deeply de upset about that they were insulting my, my partner, my lover, my spouse, okay? That they were treating my spouse as if she was a stranger. and. Uh, and so there had been a film made about, about me and Thea. Uh, there, there was a documentary. And I felt I had a documented marriage. And so I went around and, and tried to get legal support uh, to do something about getting my money back and, and finding DOMA unconstitutional. And, uh, and the gay organizations were not ready for it, but Robbie Kaplan of Four Boys stepped up and, uh, and took all my case. Uh, we were then joined by James Essex, and then in time for the Supreme Court, we were joined by Pam. And, uh, the, uh, so how did I find myself? I thought it was wonderful to be to be involved in it, to be doing something about it. Uh, and uh, and of course, with each decision, I would do with this great joy. I had some panic toward the very end. Uh, when I thought it was possible that we would get an as applied uh, answer. And, uh, and, and suddenly, 
uh, I wasn't allowed to talk about it at the time. But suddenly, the money didn't matter. What mattered terribly was the rest of the gay community. And you know, if I got my money back, and 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 somehow it was unconstitutional as applied to me only, uh, I couldn't bear that. I didn't know how we'd face the whole community. But so, of course, when the decision came in, I was very joyous when it issued. That's awesome. That's wonderful. Um, let me ask this question. Can you think of any moment in the last three years during this process where you weren't sure you wanted to be doing this? Did you have any regrets or uncertainties? No, none, none. I really would. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, great team. Okay, you couldn't go wrong. I mean, I didn't just have Robbie Kaplan. I had, I had group Evie, all right? A dozen younger lawyers, okay, who were, who were there at every turn of the thing. So the, there was always somebody there supporting me. Uh, mostly they were fun. And, uh, <laughs> so you know, I, I never hesitated for a minute. Uh, Gung ho. I read all the briefs. I took it very seriously. But I loved the whole process. I want to ask what you think about the motives of the people who worked against you, uh, the, the attorneys who were trying to defend DOMA. What do you feel about the folks who, who thought DOMA was a great idea and that you were wrong? How do you feel about the motives of the people working against you, the attorneys who were defending okay. DOMA? Well, I, I, first of all, I, just, I don't attribute motives necessarily to, to, to attorneys. I mean, I think their job is to is to, to, to defend their position or to place their position, not just to defend it. And uh, what I felt, though, was uh, you read all this stuff about, about Clements, about his power, about his friends on the, on the court, both in the New York Times and New York Magazine, and, uh, and that was a little, little nervous making. Uh, but the minute I saw the first briefs, which were not by Clement himself, but I mean, by, by some of his partners, uh, they were really bad. I mean, it was. I, you felt, I felt that God, they're not going to try. He's going to wait till the Supreme Court when he knows he'll free us. And that's really what I expected. They were just. I mean, I a few guys have read those briefs. They're really they're astoundingly terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, aside from a few places where they insult me personally, uh, they're. Uh, just the quality, the whole quality of it. Their arguments were insane, and not nearly as insane as their final super argument in, in the Supreme Court. Uh, so I was, so I'm still a little nervous about uh, about Clements himself when we got to the Supreme Court. But then I three things that, that happened at the same time. One was uh, was one that uh, okay, Pam Carlin. Okay, was providing, providing, joined us then and was providing astute advice at every step of the way. Two, in the moot courts, Robbie kept growing, you know, okay, from really almost, you could call it, and she wasn't a hick to start, obviously, we all know that, but from a hick to this really powerful, calm, uh, super uh, thing. And the last thing was their final argument was so insane. Okay, that thing of, you know, the reason that, that marriage has to pertain only to, you know, is, is necessary only for, for, uh, for opposite sex couples is because they're the only people who can, who can, uh, who can get pregnant by accident. I mean, that was just so insane. It, 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 uh, I, lost, I lost all fear of Clements, and I just had to really just a question of, of how the justices go. And, and, and I, I also had this other thing from, from when I was a little kid, really, I was passionate about the Constitution. So, so somewhere I felt, I felt safe that the Constitution is going to, is going to, you know, take over here. And, uh, and at, at the point at which Kennedy said, uh, what about the 40,000 children in California? I just, you know, relaxed. <laughs> And, and I felt very secure. Of course, you don't know. You don't know until, obviously, you go through that last month of, of 
waiting every day for the physician. But uh, that's about it. I think. So but I, I think those three facts, I think the moon cords, pan, and, uh, and this incredible argument that they put for it. I understand a few months ago. Stop being scared of Mr. Clements. Well, you defeated Mr. Clements, so I think you should be very proud of that. Well, I'm very proud of that, and uh, I'm proud for Bobby, I guess. <laughs> okay, and for and for all the older guys who were who were supporting us. Uh, I mean, my role was really kind of quiet. <laughs> I understand a few months ago. You were the Grand Marshal of the Pride Parade in New York City? Yeah. How'd yeah, you feel? People do. All together. People how, do on the street. <laughs> how did you feel about that? How was it to be Grand Marshal? I, okay. It was the same as the parade always is for me, really. Okay. I, I always get a whole lot of cheers at the parade. Everybody saves the pictures of me in the parade and has them in their offices. Sage has a big picture of me carrying the flag. Okay. I mean, that's standard. I get a lot of. People like me, and I like it because I like people a lot. Of <laughs> we, we have a lot of young people in the room, and I wonder if you have any advice for them after your experience. Advice in what, in what way? Okay, I, I mean, God, there's advice in every area. Uh, I, think, I think we keep pushing. I, I think we don't take it for granted. I think we should enjoy all of the possibilities now and proceed to, to all the next steps. There's still a lot of discrimination. There's still a lot of things to be done. And uh, I also think everybody who has been together for more than two years and, and really feels in love ought to go get papers immediately. Okay. Don't put it off until you can afford the party. You can have the party later. Okay. I do, I constantly, constantly, I go, kids are in line with me, and I repeat the same thing. Tomorrow morning, go see the court clerk. <laughs> but you'll notice I say after two years at least. That, that comes from Thea, who always said every season twice. They used to say lesbians on the second date for the uh, U Haul. And uh, the biggest thing was, you know, don't even think about new rules till all seasons twice. And if all, you know, if Christmas is the same if joyous as it was the second year as it was the first, and if you know, if each holiday was was that, uh, then uh, then go for it. Miss Edie, I think I speak for our whole crowd. I speak for our whole crowd when I say that we consider you a hero and thank you for all that you have done. I have a feeling that, okay, that the last two and a half years, so, so, and I'm not really, I'm not claiming it for us, but certainly we have a lot to do with more and more people, gay people coming out. And the more people came out, the more we saw each other, which we had never done before, really, in great quantities. And, uh, and we, we liked what we saw, loved each other, so that we really became a you know, kind of glorious community. And, and, and this business of being the hero, I thank, you know, with everything in me and with everything from Fiat, I thank, okay, every single person, okay, who has thanked me for this, because, uh, I'm living in a world of community and joy, okay? I know Thea would love it for me and for everybody else. Uh, it, it's just wonderful. Thank you, Edith Windsor. We really appreciate you. We're gonna say goodbye. I'm so sorry I'm not there. I'll try not to cry. Um, so here's how we're going to proceed with the panel on stage. I'm going to start by um, asking the four plaintiffs uh, from uh, the uh, California Proposition 8 case to share with us, uh, as Ms. Edie did, their views of their experience. And I have a couple of questions for them, but I'm going to let them go first and just um, 
Share with the, with the audience your experience over the last four years, the decision to actually stand as the plaintiffs, um, any moments of regret, any moments of pride, any moments of hilarity, uh, and, uh, and, and anything else you'd like to share. Let's start with uh, Chris and Sandy. <laughs> no, you go ahead. Um, <laughs> We learn not to fight in public, ever. <laughs> never, never a good thing. I'm Sandy. Um, and the last four and a half years for us have been fascinating, absolutely fascinating. And, and we loved our experience. And we feel very lucky and privileged to have had this experience. Um, and it was not at all what we ever expected it to be. I always say, when we got involved with the suit, it's because of our dear friend, Chad, um, who asked Chris, uh, if we might want to get in, involved because they had a professional connection. And when he brought it up, the way Chris described it to me is, Chad wants us to consider getting involved in sort of a, a small lawsuit <laughs> where we would have a very passive role. It would be administrative, and pro administrative proceedings. And we would just kind of be on paper, but we wouldn't really have to do anything. Um, <laughs> And it had the potential to go, to go big, but who knew? And regardless, it would be so easy for us because it would just be our names on paper. And I'd like to say that, Chad, that was not true. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't know if it was smoke and mirrors or if he also had absolutely no idea. Yeah, so, so interesting moments of the process. Uh, number one, being in court the day Judge Walker said we were going to have a trial and being dumbfounded in that procedure and looking at each other saying, Tr did he say trial? Like trial on television with witnesses? And we were asking the DNA, like witnesses? Like we could be witnesses? And she said, yeah, I think so. <laughs> and that was a turning point. That's when um, we went from kind of just watching what was happening to really being a part of what was happening. And that's where it became fantastic and amazing and scary and, and stressful at times. So um, parts that I thought were like the most difficult would be preparing for being a witness in the trial, preparing for deposition, and preparing for trial itself, and um, having the having the, the for us the possibility of our testimony being televised, which was on one hand very good and very powerful, possibly because it would educate you know different people could see what was happening in the courtroom, but from a personal perspective, it was intimidating because to have your personal life be on YouTube was a scary thought for, at least for me. For and, everyone, I yeah. would think. <laughs> so, um, but it was, it was a great experience and we feel uh, like to, to be in a position where you're representing a case that we care so much about and a cause we care so much about and hopefully helping people that we don't even know access something that's important to them and helping children grow up in a world where they have a better chance at happiness and equality, to be in that role was an absolute privilege. And we are very, very grateful to have gotten to do it. Chris? <laughs> I think you've covered everything. <laughs> but not everything. Um, so the, maybe the one additional feature to the experience of being plaintiffs in this case, um, for me, and I think for all of us on different levels, was how important it was to search for the truth in ourselves and in our relationships. So where that might seem obvious to all of you that of course you know who you are, you know who your partner is, and you know what your relationship is all about, the process of going through trial prep and being on the stand and then watching the process unfold over a number of years is a different kind of test of your ability to withstand scrutiny and pressure and the unknown. And so I'm very proud of all of us, and I mean all of us and people that aren't here for doing that as a team. Um, it really is the difference between being successful and not. No one person up here could ever have achieved this. As Edie said, there were so many people helping and there, it was a team. And despite the team, there is a moment you are alone on the stand and it is about you and your truth. And your truth is what's powerful to people. So if you can tell them why it is you're being harmed and what the harm is, they listen. It's what it's really, the process is really for 
people feeling wronged. Mm -hmm. And in our case, just being who we are was essentially wrong, just to be born this way, live this way, love this way. And I had gotten so good at not being mad about it that I had a hard time getting ready for trial. It was really hard to go underneath the veneer of it's okay, I'm fine, I can achieve things, I'm successful, I can parent, I can work, I can be a good daughter, and not really explore the harm. And Ted Olson would repeat over and over again in court and briefs that this was so harmful. And I kept thinking, he's exaggerating. Why is he exaggerating the harm? And um, in some ways, it made me very uncomfortable because what has worked in my life is to not draw lots of attention to this experience because it's not a positive experience. And the trial and the team and all of the work that we did allowed me in the presence of everyone here um, and everyone in the courtroom to, ex to expose that vulnerability. And I think someday when you see the tape and you watch it happen, you'll see that there's a moment where it, it transforms the, the, the courtroom. And it's really a hard thing to do. And I'm really happy I had the, the privilege of doing it. And I'm happy I have the gift of knowing I can do it. And I think all of you, if you felt as harmed by something as the government telling you you don't get to choose who you love and marry them, uh, you would do it too. But you would probably have to shed an awful lot of thick skin to get to the point where you're making sense and you don't sound like a sound bite. Um, so that was, um, for me, the best part. I don't remember feeling like anything was hilarious <laughs> at... Uh, that point in time, we'll get to the hilarious parts. They happened when we won. Um, but during the process, there was an awful lot of hand wringing and um, nervous black burying and it, sleepless nights. I, there's really no way to sugarcoat it. It was hard. Paul. Oh. Well, between Chris and Sandy, they pretty much bullet pointed everything that I had in my head. <laughs> so I'm gonna give you a recipe. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I, just to echo what Chris said, the, the truth part of it was the biggest part for me because everyone says, well, how hard was this and what did you have to do and how did you prep? And at every turn, the remarkable part was I just stayed true to myself. I said to Jeff, we just have to be ourselves. We just have to tell our story. We just have to be true to who we are, not sugarcoat anything, not embed any exaggeration in this harm that we're feeling. And in that process, um, it exposed a weakness in our relationship. And that weakness was we never really sat down to talk about just how important marriage was to each other and to us as a couple. We just did exactly what Chris said. We kind of glossed over it. We lived our days. We were successful in other areas. We didn't have to worry about it because we never expected it to be a part of our lives because we were prohibited from those rights. And when we started to dig into how that made us feel, sometimes those moments where you felt that they were exaggerated in the briefs about the harms were actually realities for us. We were like, wow, we really, we couldn't watch one more jewelry commercial during the holidays without going, damn it, <laughs> we need to be married. Um, so it not only transformed us, but it transformed our ideas. It transformed how we felt about the law and what, how we should never really step away from something because of fear of doing something. And it was a very deep and meaningful process to become part of the uh, plaintiff team and the team of lawyers and others that helped. And to, to speak on what Sandy said, I mean, we, it was, we were kind of <laughs> come to do a photo shoot on Prop 8 and end up being a plaintiff <laughs> in a federal lawsuit. Um, but I'll tell the story of how Jeff and I got involved. And I think it, it's really the moment where it changed everything for us was Jeff, for a few weeks, was trying to get me to watch the National Organization on Marriages um, commercial called what, A Gathering Storm. You guys recognize this thing? And he's like, you have to watch it. You have to watch it. I'm like, I'm too busy. Dad, you know, I don't want to see it. It's going to make me angry. And one night, he, he sat me down. I popped open the laptop, and I watched it. And I stood up, and I just said, that's it. That's it. Because that was the moment for me. I was like, that's not who we are. That's not how we should be represented. 
and they actually cast a commercial to have people say these words that were so wrong and hurtful, and that was it for me. That was the breaking moment. I said, we're doing something. We're doing something. Even if it's a cathartic thing for us to do so we could feel better in our own home about ourselves. And four days later, we had 50 people on a sound stage that were ready to shoot a like, shot-for-shot response video to tell Maggie Gallagher that she was wrong to tell her that she was spreading hate and it is discrimination and there's no way to sugarcoat what you're doing and say that you're protecting the rights of other people because you're prohibiting them from us. And um, you know, we, we shot this little thing and a friend of ours edited it and he put it on YouTube and it was a Tuesday and I went to work and every few minutes I'd get a text message from Jeff saying, it's at 10,000 views, it's at 15,000 views, it's at 90,000 views. Um, and at one point, it crested 160 or 170,000 views within 24 hours of being on air uh, on YouTube. So speaking of YouTube, it's what really got us involved in this because it, immediately we were cast as the activists about Prop 8. And my phone rang the next day, and it was Wolf Blitzer. <laughs> and I'm thinking... I, I'm so sorry. Yeah, um, yeah. Um... <laughs> It was a funny conversation. That was a hilarious thing, because I was like, oh, shut up. I had a friend, blah, blah, blah. He's like, no, it's Wolf Blitzer. I'm like, that's not Wolf Blitzer. Um, <laughs> so it was Wolf Blitzer. And, um, and he's like, well, how do you feel about being an activist? And I know that Jeff has a great term for what it was. It's an, it was we, were, we, we became a accidental activists, because we weren't activists. We are just regular people who told a story via a social media network. And that story that we thought was profoundly ours wasn't profoundly ours. It was profoundly everyone's voice. And that was a transform transformation for us in that moment. We got involved with the case. And to echo what, exactly what Kristen Sandy said, it was very, very tough. I don't think I've ever explored the boundaries of nervousness and, and feeling no regret, but feeling like the, the one thing that you have to do in your life that is right in front of you, and you have to make the choice to do it or not. It's going to be the hardest thing to do. But there is no choice, because it's so right. And that didn't, we didn't matter at that point any longer. It wasn't about us as people. It was about us as a community. It was about us as a whole being treated right. And so it was an amazing experience. And the thing I take away from it most is not the moment that changed everything for me in my life was getting married. That one moment did everything. But it was about understanding community and understanding working as a team, like you said, understanding having the voice be echoed by so many people that came back to us and said, your story is my story, and it's our story. And that's really powerful, and it continues. Um, like they said, there's so much more work to do, but we got really, really lucky. Like, I feel I can never play the lotto ever because of this case, because we were so lucky to be a part of it and so lucky to be connected to the people we are. Um, and that's the most valuable thing for me, is I'm enriched as a person because of the people that were involved in this case. Jeff. Now there's really nothing left. <laughs> no. um, I, I'll just, uh, just a couple of stories. One, you talked about uh, the level of scrutiny and the level of disagreement around the filing of this case. Um, living in Los Angeles, uh, once we had decided to, be, to become part of the case, and the case was announced uh, at the end of May in 2009, uh, Paul did come home one night. Uh, he works in a, a very high-profile gym in West Hollywood, and all day was getting people saying comments to him about, you know, you guys are troublemakers, you really want to do this, you could set the movement back 10 years, are you really doing the right thing? And there was a moment of doubt. I mean, there was a moment of doubt that had crept in, uh, and we were standing in the kitchen, and, this, and I, I can remember it as, as a, if it was yesterday. Um, I was standing at one end of the kitchen, and he was sitting at the other end of the kitchen. And I'm, just, I'm going to be descriptive here, but I was actually putting something in the microwave. And I slammed the, mic, the microwave door. And I actually raised my voice to him. And I, hadn't, I don't normally do that. We don't normally do that to each other. But it was a moment of frustration for me uh, saying, well, you know what? At least we can do something. At least we're doing something. At least we know that we didn't stand for being treated as second class anymore. Win or lose. If we win, it's great for us. It's great for thousands of people. If we lose, at least we decided, you know what? We're not going to be treated as second class, and we're going to do something. And I think w the doing something part is really what any one of us could do. 
you know, in the world we live in today, anybody in this room and anyone around the world can make their voices louder. And there's so many avenues with which to do that. And this process for me, um, I think for Paul and I, we could go through it together. And I'm sure Chris and Sandy the same thing. It wasn't as if one of the members of the relationship was going through something that was quite stressful. And the other person could have to look at it from a point of sympathy. Where because we were going through it together, we could go through it from a point of empathy. And the, the toughest moments early on with, uh, you know, I remember when the, the, that whole thing in the courtroom with Judge Walker when he said he wanted to have a trial. And I remember how excited Ted and David were that there was going to be a trial. <laughs> uh, and then understanding what that meant from us. Uh, you know, I think the NA was in the room for my deposition and my deposition prep. So she probably knows more about me than Paul does. But, uh, you know, that's, that's something you don't ever think about. You know, the questions that, you know, the, to be honest with you, the prep was worse than the actual trial. Uh, but, you know, that's because the lawyers need to do their job. But they were asking me questions that they would really never have to ask an opposite sex couple. And was frankly really none of their business. But they needed to know it because of their job. But it just sort of, that just reiterated for me how important it was that we get through it and then we move on from it. And I'll tell you the best part about it was the constant winning. We won, <laughs> we won, we won. But at the same time we were winning, there was something going on nationally. You know, the, minds were changing, hearts were being moved. And I really think that, that the Perry case and the Windsor case are really, you know, watershed moments for our community. We have, we've had, we haven't had a lot of great ones, but I think, you know, June 26th, 2013, and I can't help but when I, when I watch Edie, how could you not love Edie? I mean, she's just not incredible. Um, the, the moment, I, I, it really just struck me when Edie was talking was that on, and I'm, I'm going to end on a downer here, but on June 26, 2013, she won and we won. I had someone to celebrate it with. So did Chris and Sandy, but Edie didn't. And that's, uh, but she was able to celebrate it and, and she was embraced by a community that reached out to her and loved her. And I think, I don't think there's a person in the gay and lesbian community that doesn't just love her for what she, de what she has done. Um, you know, we may have played a part in, in California allowing you to marry, but Edie forced the government to recognize it. And, and I think that's something we should all be proud of. Chad Griffin, they're talking bad about you, man. They're, they're, they're saying you, you sold them a bill of goods. So I'm wondering if you could share with the audience um, the two questions, recruiting plaintiffs and recruiting lawyers. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, first of all, I, I don't know if you guys can tell, but this is a family. Um, we literally uh, live together. Um, throughout the trial for uh, Chris and Sandy actually live in Northern California, but Paul and Jeff and me and many folks from our team, I think 10 of us rented a house for six weeks and, uh, and lived in that house in San Francisco leading up to trial and, <clears throat> and during trial. So we truly became a family. Um, and as we went through this process, um, we worked very hard to ensure that everyone was prepared for what we we're about to go through. What none of us, not a single person, and if anyone says they knew it, that it was gonna happen, they're lying to you. No one thought there would be a trial. No one. Including our opposition, by the way, and I suppose they uh, hated it most of all. Um, <laughs> because what you find is when you put discrimination on trial, it has a hard time standing up particularly when folks are put under oath. Um, it acts as a bit of truth serum uh, to those so-called expert witnesses um, that our opposition uh, put forth and that the uh, incredible legal team uh, here to my right and their colleagues, uh, when they deposed those witnesses, um, in fact, most of them from the other side uh, decided they weren't gonna show up to trial. Um, they were left with, with one or two um, and those people uh, ended up being on our side by the end of it all. Um, but truly none of us uh, thought there was going to be a trial. And 
You know, if I go all the way back to Proposition 8's um, passing, and being at, um, first of all, being one of the most depressed people in the world when we lost that night, um, because of the message, it sucks to lose, but the message that was sent on that night to LGBT people all over the state, uh, and quite frankly, all over the country, uh, was horrendous. They were told they're second-class citizens uh, and that they're less than. And the consequences of that um, are, in some instances, tragic. And so I and others, no one knew exactly what to do, but we all wanted to do something. You heard these brilliant plaintiffs explain sort of what they were. When, when none of us um, knew each other, I knew uh, Chris and Sandy and, and later was introduced uh, to Paul and Jeff, and we didn't know what to do. Um, and one day I was at um, a lunch uh, in Los Angeles, California, and I was with um, a couple of friends, and we were talking about how depressing the night was. Yeah, it was great, President Obama won, we should be cheering, but no, we're depressed. And someone walked by our table and started talking to us. I was with Rob Reiner and uh, his wife, Michelle, and my friend um, and our, our partner in this effort, Christina Shockey. And someone walked by the table and um, started speaking uh, to, to Rob and Michelle. They knew her. And just as she's leaving, she says, oh, by the way, that whole marriage thing, that whole Prop 8 thing, if you ever decide to go to court again, someone should really talk to my former brother-in-law, Ted Olson. I thought nothing of it. Um, I drove home um, across town, and a few hours later, um, Michelle and Rob called me, and they're like, you know, she was serious. Would you ever talk to Ted Olson? And I was like, well, first of all, it's laughable to think that Ted Olson and I would agree on any subject <laughs> whatsoever. Um, but <coughs> if we agree on this one, it's a game changer for our movement. Um, and so I did, uh, I did two phone calls uh, with Ted that I will never forget uh, the rest of my life where we just initially started to get to know each other and uh, talk about this issue both from a personal standpoint and on personal convictions as it relates to these issues um, as well as uh, professionally um, and what a legal strategy might look like. Um, we then agreed to confidentially meet uh, in person in Washington, D.C. And each of us disclosed the two people uh, in both of our worlds that would know we were doing this meeting. We agreed that it needed to be confidential and off the record, including most folks in our professional and personal world. So we exchanged those names. Uh, we came to the agreement, and I was in New York, and I took the train down to D.C. I went to college in Washington. I had worked in the Clinton administration. I had many friends in D.C. It was the first time in my life that I didn't sell, tell a single person that I was going to Washington because I didn't want to have to lie to them when they asked why I was there. And I walked in, I was nervous, and I walked into uh, Ted's office, and I, I, I can detail this office, you know, point by point, book by book, um, and I was seated in this chair, and he comes in, and he sits down across from me, and the door closes, and, and we're like this, Ted's right here, and I'm right here. But all I'm seeing around him is a bookshelf that has photos on it. There's Ronald Reagan, there's George Bush, there's every person that I'd spent my life despising and fighting. And I'm like, something's wrong with this picture. Where am I? Um, long story short, um, Ted Olson uh, is personally um, a hero and professionally a hero to our community today. Uh, and his involvement in this case truly changed the landscape um, and changed the way that we view the issue of marriage. It really lifted the partisan veil from which we've always discussed this issue and shined the spotlight um, on these uh, amazing plaintiffs uh, and their lives um, and their stories. So really incredible. Now to the point of, okay, we've got a lawyer, we've got a co-counsel in David Boyes, the most, one of the most brilliant trial lawyers um, today, and oh, by the way, we also have this incredible narrative of the guy who represented Gore in Bush v. Gore and the guy who represented Bush in Bush v. Gore. Um, so we continued to keep this secret as we really vetted the idea. There were about five of us um, over the course of a couple of months uh, that were in the loop, and then we moved to a phase of really talking to, to potential plaintiffs and folks that you needed to be able to trust um, because we knew that, first of all, you might meet with some folks that might decide not to do it, or you might decide for whatever reason they're not the right plaintiffs uh, in this case, but you needed to trust that they weren't going to go leak it and tell the story. Um, 
And one day I was in my office, and uh, Chris and I had worked together on a number of things for a long time um, in the area of early childhood education. And um, she called me about something, um, and we were talking on the phone, and I had this moment that I stopped listening to her. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, Chris and Sandy, they are the perfect <laughs> plaintiffs in this case. I asked her to hold on. I went into my, my friend and colleague Christina's office, and I looked at her, and I just said, Chris and Sandy. And she's looking at me like, what? Plaintiffs. And she jumps out of her chair and goes, yes. Um, I went back to the phone, and I asked if we could change the subject. And I said, I want to talk to you about something confidential. Um, and I think I generally describe this as a high-profile public awareness raising campaign um, <laughs> because exactly. we were on the phone. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and long story short, Chris and Sandy uh, became the plaintiffs. And then a friend of mine who had worked uh, with Paul and Jeff on the ad that they described to you um, that they put together uh, and led, um, I was talking to this friend and I said, um, you know, I really need um, a gay couple uh, that could join uh, this case. These were some friends that I had confided in. And they said, you know, we met these two guys. You really need to meet them. Um, and so we began a process of, of meeting with Paul and Jeff, and I'll never forget the day they came to my house. Uh, they won't forget that day either. Um, and I sat down and I really described to them um, in person uh, what it was likely to be like, uh, and that we have real opposition. We have opposition with money, they are mean-spirited, and in past they've done whatever it takes uh, in order to win. Um, and your lives are really going to be put, now at the time we didn't know quite the extent to which their lives would be put on the public stage, um, but their lives were put on the public stage and they didn't tell you um, all of the stories, but what they went through uh, was incredible. There wasn't a moment in their lives for four years where there wasn't a reporter, there weren't TV cameras, there weren't um, you know, folks that were listening to every single thing they did, whatever they posted on Facebook, whatever they tweeted. Um, and, and they brilliantly, um, they and their families, um, brilliantly went through this and represented all of us. And um, there, there were a lot of things that happened. They were harassed, uh, Chris and Sandy in particular. Um, the police were involved. People were harassing them at their home. Um, they went through a lot for all of us. Um, they are the ones that carried the burden uh, for, for everyone else. And we owe them a great, great deal of gratitude. So now it's time to bring in the lawyers. And we're going to start with Theonae, uh, who uh, in her role at Gibson Dunn filed the original complaint to start the lawsuit. And uh, why don't you tell us about the approach to the complaint and sort of thinking about what you were trying to set up strategically as you filed that? OK, well, I. I just want to say first how amazing it is to be here, and I feel like I'm reunited with <laughs> not just friends, but family. I mean, we went through this together for the last four and a half years, and uh, it was such an incredibly meaningful experience, both professionally and personally, and I feel so privileged to have been part of this team. Um, I became a part of the case. I will never forget this moment. Uh, it was a Friday afternoon, it was late on a Friday, and I got a call from a partner, and as a, an associate, you sometimes don't answer on Friday afternoon, <laughs> but I learned that it was probably the best thing that I did. Um, the call was from Ted Boutros, who was with Ted Olson leading the Gibson Dunn team. It was very early in the process, and it was still highly confidential that we were working on, going to be bringing this lawsuit, and uh, Ted called me and he said, uh, I'd like to get you involved. I wanted to see if you're interested in getting involved in a, a case that we're, that we're bringing. Um, it's a, a challenge to Proposition 8, and this was in March of, uh, March of 2009, and I'm thinking, isn't there already a challenge in California State Court of Proposition 8? And, and he said, in federal court. And I it was silence, you know, silence on the phone, because I knew I, I, I thought maybe I didn't hear him right, because he said that it was a case that he was bringing with Ted Olson, and then it was a federal challenge of Proposition 8, and I'm thinking, <laughs> I had to just pause, because it was so incredible. Uh, I knew immediately what that meant, the gravity of that, of bringing a suit in federal court. It was, it was um, something that I thought 
everyone had decided we just don't do because of the legacy of Bowers and, and of the risks of being in federal court. And I'd heard that so many times when I was in law school and in my constitutional law classes. And um, I thought that the strategy was to be in state court. So I knew that this was a game changer to say the least, and then I learned about David, and uh, and and so it all just was uh, incredibly uh, exciting, but also a little bit terrifying. And Ted said we'd we'd like you know I'd like you to start drafting the complaint. We we have to start, you know, <laughs> we're going to bring bring the lawsuit. So um, that so and it was very top secret even within the firm. Uh, only. Our, a very small number of us on the team knew about this. And we, so I, I started just devouring everything I could. Um, the, you know, Lawrence versus Texas, Romer versus Evans, Loving versus Virginia, the cases that you learn about in law school and con law. And it was um, an incredible experience. And from the beginning, we decided to frame the case really around two principles. And it's um, very simple, and it was very, I think, easy to understand. And, and Ted and David have talked about this, that our case was about liberty and equality. It was about the fundamental right to marry. And in terms of the law, that's due process. And it's about the fundamental right to equality and equal protection. So uh, the case was framed around those two claims, and we had our four plaintiffs, and really um, the, the legal precedents were pretty simple too. It, it was not all that difficult when you think about it, but it was at the same time um, something that was in incredibly uh, risky <laughs> because we, we all, knew that if it didn't turn out well, you know, that there was, the, that it, it was something that would have consequences. So we were very careful. And, um, and you know, when you, when you look back at um, the major civil rights cases, they were, I think actually we didn't think that this was going to go to trial, but uh, a number of those cases were actually tried. But we thought initially that this would be a case that would be decided on the papers that would be uh, decided through a preliminary injunction and then summary judgment. And we were not thinking of it as something that would go to trial. Um, so when, when it became clear that Judge Walker wanted to have a trial, I think that changed everything for us. And it was in a matter of six months that we got ready for trial. So it, it happened very quickly. And, uh, and, and you know, it was not something that we'd planned for. I'm going to shift from Thene to Jeremy and um, to talk about the trial stage itself. And I'm going to presage this with two observations about the trial and then and get Jeremy to respond. The first is that the uh, defendant interveners recruited a, an expert. Um, I guess I can say his name because it's in the record. His name is Paul Nathanson. And he was an expert on religion. And in his expert report, he, um, right off the bat, basically first paragraph, said that broadly understood, religion played no role in the passage of Proposition 8. And I kept thinking that the second paragraph was going to say that the sun played no role in light and warmth on planet Earth. <laughs> uh, so so, so that, was, that was my first sort of weird response. And the second was, once I got involved, I, I read everything that happened in the case. And in a pretrial hearing, when Judge Walker asked uh, Chuck Cooper, the lead attorney for uh, the defendant interveners, if he could specifically tell the court what harm would result to heterosexual couples and their children if same-sex couples were allowed to marry, he quite famously answered in court, I don't know. Which, I'm not a lawyer, but I understand that's bad. Um, <laughs> so I want to ask Jeremy if he would uh, share with us a little bit about the trial and specifically about the counsel and the experts for the defendant interveners and sort of what um, what Ted and David and, and the team were up against um, with the other side. Thank you, um, Gary. And let me also say that every time I hear 
um, our plaintiffs speak, I am amazed and breathless, uh, just as I was in the trial, and I'm so happy to be, be back with you all and listen to you speak again. It's, it's so moving to hear you talk uh, about the experiences you've had, and it played, I think, such an important role in our case to have you uh, take the stand under all of that pressure and talk about what marriage meant to you and how hurtful it was to have the right to marry be taken away. That was such an important part of, of what we did, and I know it was very difficult for you to talk about it so publicly. Um, and it's an interesting contrast because we had that very moving testimony. We also had a sparkling roster of experts, including Gary here. Um, and it was quite a contrast with the case that the proponents uh, put on. And I've often been asked that question, where were the proponents? Where were their experts, the people who were going to get up and justify the claims that had been made during the campaign about why Proposition 8 was necessary? Where were the proponents themselves, the people who organized, who put this measure on the ballot, who campaigned for its passage? Why weren't they standing up to explain what they had done and why they did it? Um, and it sort of leads to another, uh, another question, um, which is, was this a failure of lawyering by the proponents? Did they blow it by basically not showing up? And I think the answer to that question is no. No, they didn't. Um, you know, I think Judge Walker um, pointed out in in his opinion, that it, what they put on was not an impressive display. Um, but trust me, it was far, far better than the alternative. Um, I'll give a, a couple of examples. Gary mentioned Paul Nathanson. Um, he is at uh, McGill with another of their experts, Catherine Young. He, he wrote some articles and books about um, why uh, gay marriage would be a bad thing. He had testified uh, in Canada when they were debating it um, there. Uh, at his deposition, the first thing, he was deposed by David Boyce in Montreal. The first thing that David did was ask him whether he was an expert in uh, certain fields. He went through all of them. Anthropology, nope. Psychology, nope. History? Nope. Basically, he got through everything, all the social sciences, all the humanities. There was nothing left for him. He, it was clear at the end of that short series of questions that anything he wanted to say about uh, why gay marriage wouldn't be a good thing had absolutely no scientific backing whatsoever. That was done very quickly. Then let's move on to something else. Well, he had, he had written this report as Gary mentioned, that said, well, you know, there were religious groups on both sides of the issue. Um, and even though somebody was religious, that doesn't mean they supported Prop 8 for a uh, religious reason. They could have a secular reason for supporting it. It wasn't a, um, it wasn't a compelling piece of scholarship, uh, and, and Gary was fully prepared to take it apart. But instead of, instead of uh, doing that at the deposition, uh, what David did instead was to ask um, uh, Paul Nathanson about uh, religion and how it has acted as a source of prejudice against gay people. And he certainly had to concede that that was true. Um, and so he talked about that for a while. And then David asked him about whether marriage would benefit um, gay people, notwithstanding the feeling that it would be bad for society or bad in some broader context, wouldn't it benefit gay people if they were allowed to marry? And he had to agree with that too. And so we wrapped up the deposition and so what we had to play at trial was Paul Nathanson going on about religion as a source of prejudice against gay people and the benefits <laughs> of marriage for gay people. Um, with, with Catherine Young, the same thing, the same questions at the beginning of the deposition. Not an expert in a dozen different fields. 
So she has nothing she can say about that. She's there supposedly to testify about the universality of the definition of marriage throughout history, throughout, across cultures. And she had done this before. She had um, testified in the Varnum case in Iowa. She had testified in Canada. And because she had done this before, she had been beaten up a lot of times about um, exceptions, about places uh, where um, cultures did recognize um, same-sex marriages. And so what David had her do, since she knew the examples so well, she uh, just build the catalog. And so she spent a great part of her deposition talking about, OK, well, in the Americas, there are the following examples of same-sex marriage. And in India, well, there are these examples. And in China, there are these examples. And then in Africa, there are these examples. And so we also had a very nice uh, video <laughs> clip from her to play at the trial. Um, there was no one. There was no one they put forward who actually had done any rigorous scientific work to establish any of the claims that were made about Proposition 8. Had any of those people showed up at trial, it would have been so much worse. And sure, so the proponent's lawyer said, I don't know what the harm is, he said, we don't need evidence. He said, it's always been this way. Just read Blackstone. He said, well, it's too soon to tell what will really happen. And he said, you know what? The people of California could just decide to play it safe and wait. All of these things were grossly inadequate. No question about it. We had established the severe harm that was being done by Proposition 8. None of this would do the trick for him, but it was better than anything else he had. I, just, I think it's important to, um, to keep that in mind. The, the reason their case failed is that there was nothing behind it, nothing to support it. Thanks. Um, I want to go back to CNA for a second. Um, the trial obviously ended successfully. Uh, Judge Walker ruled uh, in, in favor of the plaintiffs with a very long finding of fact, but then began a, a fairly long appellate process which had two distinct tracks, one on the merits of the case and the other on the issue of whether or not the defendant interveners had the right to appeal it, and that even had a weird sort of detour to the California Supreme Court. So could you um, kind of walk us through what happened after trial? Well, I think it really, I think echoes what Jeremy said um, about the interesting, one of the interesting things about this case is that nobody wanted to defend Proposition 8. When it came down to it, the proponents' experts backed out or they didn't call them at trial, and then even the state didn't want to defend the law. So the governor, the attorney general, Nobody wanted to stand up and say that Proposition 8 is constitutional. So we were stuck with a very interesting situation where at trial the proponents had intervened and they adequately represented and defended the law uh, vigorously. So there was, and they were standing in the district court, but then on appeal when Judge Walker struck down Proposition 8, there was no, because the, the state defendants didn't file a notice of appeal, there was, uh, and only the proponents did, there was um, a question of whether there was actually jurisdiction over the appeal because the parties withstanding to defend the law, the state, chose not to appeal. So we spotted this issue right away, and from the very beginning of the case, we knew that well, we, we decided that we would make every argument possible. We would argue that Proposition 8 violated due process. We would argue that it violated equal protection both because sexual orientation is a suspect classification and it should be subjected to, to the most rigorous judicial scrutiny, strict scrutiny, and um, also because even under the lowest level of scrutiny, rational basis, it was unconstitutional because uh, it it, it was irrational. And so we had made every argument, and then we had another argument for uh, in, our, 
in our um, arguments on appeal, which was the fact that there was no standing. So we raised that, um, and the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals certified the question to the California Supreme Court. And this is a process where when there's a question of, of state law, and the Ninth Circuit viewed this as a question of state law, of whether the proponents of Proposition 8, who were the people who put it on the ballot, but not the actual elected officials, uh, if did they have standing to represent the interests of the state under California law? We argued that as a matter of federal Article Three standing, they didn't have um, standing, and both as a matter of state law and federal law, law they were not permitted to file the uh, appeal, to prosecute the appeal. So the Ninth Circuit, it, it took a very long time because um, we were in the Ninth Circuit and then we went to the California Supreme Court and the California Supreme Court held that the proponents did have standing under California law. But that was, again, only an issue of California law and not federal standing. So this was um, an, an issue that continued to be at, at issue in the Ninth Circuit and then in the Supreme Court, but the Ninth Circuit's decision was on the merits and it said that Proposition 8 was unconstitutional and that the proponents did have standing and uh, then the Supreme Court disagreed and, and held that the proponents didn't have standing and, and what that meant for us was that the district court's decision, which was the 400 uh, excuse me, the, the 100 page um, decision of Judge Walker striking down Proposition 8 on the broadest grounds possible stands and, and that was the result of that decision. Great. I'm gonna, thank you. I'm gonna turn to Pam Carlin, um, who is um, uniquely qualified to speak on the issue of standing just broadly. And before I ask Pam about standing, I'm gonna um, sort of familiarize the audience that the two cases that we're talking about here tonight, the Proposition 8 case and Windsor versus the United States, um, they're distinct actions making distinct claims against distinct law, uh, but they were very closely intertwined. Um, the, the, uh, the, uh, the attorneys certainly communicated, uh, the, the experts for the first case ended up serving uh, on the second case. Um, and so I think that, that it's fair to say that their fates were kind of tied together, even though, as a legal matter, they were not. Uh, Pam worked extensively on the standing matter with respect to the DOMA case, uh, but I know that she's uh, got a lot to say about uh, standing, broadly speaking. And so, Pam, I'm wondering if you could sort of give us the 30,000-foot the law professor's view of these two cases as, as a question of sort of federal jurisprudence and what should we think about them with respect to the gay rights movement. Sure, so before I, before I start, um, I just want to ask how many people in the audience are not lawyers? Okay. Or I, 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 those of you who are at the law school, you can, you know, how many of you have studied no law at all? Okay, great. So that, that, tells, me, that tells me something about how, how to talk about the case. Um, I mean, to begin with, I mean, I think all of us um, who are lawyers you, you, or, and people, you could never hope for a better spouse than uh, Edie Windsor. Uh, you could never hope for a better estate than the Aspires. Um, <laughs> and you could never hope for a better, uh, uh, better kind of case to work with and team. I mean, the opportunity to work on the case was just uh, a wonderful one. And the interesting thing is, although you know Jeremy is 100% right, they, there were no good uh, arguments on the other side. It's important to realize that we won five to four. Uh, and uh, this is an illustration of why, uh, to go back to something that Jane Schachter was saying at the morning session, timing is everything in these cases. I actually think that the best thing that could possibly have happened uh, to the Perry case was the trial, both because it laid out uh, the facts and it showed that there was nothing on the other side, and because it slowed the case down enough so that the country and the justices caught up with where the plaintiffs were going. That is, I think that when uh, Chuck Cooper came into this case to defend it, he thought it was gonna be at the Supreme Court within six months and he was gonna win. And I think that it was the, the trial and the velocity of change outside the courts that affected uh, what happened uh, inside the court. 
Um, the Supreme Court would have decided, I think, both cases differently earlier on. There was a, an amazing moment at the oral argument in the Perry case at the Supreme Court when uh, Justice Scalia went, you know, angry mano, uh, mano with uh, Ted Olson on when was it that same-sex marriage became a constitutional right? And he said, you know, in 1789, you know, in 1868, and they went back and forth. And the answer is, um, in 1868, you couldn't have found a person in the United States who would have found a right for marriage equality. Uh, when I was clerking at the Supreme Court in 1986, which was the year of Bowers against Hardwick, you could not have found maybe a single justice who would have said that gay and lesbian couples have the right to get married. Um, and so timing is critical to cases like this. And that timing also explains the odd standing issue in both cases, which is that neither the government of California in the Perry litigation nor the United States in the Windsor litigation was willing to defend the statute by the time it got to the Supreme Court. And generally, the Supreme Court hears cases where the two parties in front of it disagree. One party says the statute's constitutional, the other party says it isn't. Um, they don't generally, uh, uh, under our constitutional system, decide abstract questions of law. And so there was this very real question when the cases got to the Supreme Court, whether the Supreme Court would say, courts simply cannot decide the issue when the two parties on the opposite side of the V, when uh, the state of California and Perry, who were the actual parties, uh, in the Perry litigation, or the United States and E.D. Windsor, who were the actual parties in the Windsor litigation, agree on the outcome. That's not what courts do. And so in each of the cases, there was this question, how do you get beyond that to get a decision from the court? And in uh, Edie's case, we had the fortunate fact that the United States, although it agreed that DOMA was unconstitutional, had Edie's $367,000. Uh, because uh, as those of you who followed the Affordable Care Act case the year before may know, uh, you cannot sue to stop collection of a federal tax. You have to pay the tax and then sue for a refund. And so uh, in our case, we were fortunate enough to be able to say to the Supreme Court, even if the federal government agrees that DOMA is unconstitutional, unless and until they give back Edie's money, there is a live case or controversy that the Supreme Court can decide. Uh, and so that's how we actually got the case adjudicated. It, you know, it's a case that's about one of the most fundamental and monumental human freedoms there is, the right to marry, but it actually uh, operates as a tax refund case. <laughs> uh, and so uh, that's how uh, we got uh, the case uh, uh, adjudicated on the merits. I think what happened in the Perry case is the Supreme Court didn't want to decide the issue on the merits. That is, they could have decided the issue if they had really wanted to, uh, but they didn't want to because they're not ready to decide the issue today. And so uh, they used the standing issue as a way of unraveling the case in a way that was pleasing to them, which is I think they were, would be perfectly happy to say in California that uh, gay and lesbian couples should get married. The real question is when does the Supreme Court feel that it's prepared to step in and end a battle over something in the culture wars? And we know, for example, that from the time the Supreme Court first started thinking about the interracial marriage issue until the time they felt themselves confident enough to decide it was about a decade. And so the question is when the current Supreme Court will feel um, confident uh, enough to decide the, to decide the issue. Um, I think of this a little bit like, uh, and some of you have heard this, the, the old joke about the couple, they're in their 90s and they go to see their family lawyer and they say, we, we want a divorce. And the lawyer says to them, you know, Sadie, Jack, or 50 years from now, you know, Ellen, Susan, you've been married, you know, 56 years, you have, you know, what's going on? We've hated each other since like the second year. Um, and they say, well, why did you stay together all these years? And they say, we've been waiting for the kids to die. Um, and I think that where we now are is we are waiting for a generation to die uh, because the velocity of the change is so fast that 50 years from now, people will look back at this and they will not understand what this is about.
They just won't understand what this is about. But that generation of people for whom this is a fundamental piece of their identity is straight people have marriage and gay people don't um, has to die out before uh, I think the court will feel fully comfortable deciding the, deciding the issue. Let, let the record show that Pam Carlin does not hold punches back. So. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying we're supposed to kill people. I'm just saying we're waiting for them to die. <laughs> so to open up the questioning, we're going to let Natalia Renta from Outlaw uh, offer the first couple of questions, and then we're going to invite you to come to the microphones and pose questions to anyone on the panel. So Natalia, you first. Thank you. Um, well, firstly, I want to thank everyone in the panel for being here and, and sharing your experiences with us. Um, it is truly a privilege to have all of you, uh, plaintiffs and counsel in both cases here in one panel. Um, so I first want to direct a question to the plaintiffs. Um, there's no question that you all demonstrated immense commitment and dedication to the cause by your invaluable participation in the litigation, for which I, and I'm sure the rest of the room, am immensely thankful. Um, I can only imagine how daunting it might have felt to have the spotlight shine on you and your relationships for years. Um, I was wondering if you could share specific instances when you felt particularly empowered in your role representing our community, as well as instances when you felt that role was particularly challenging. I'll let um, Jeff and Paul go first, and then. Thanks. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think uh, challenging, without a doubt, was was really just understanding the enormity of what was about to happen. I think, um, as everyone up here has, has said, that the trial changed everything. We, uh, we went from just being people that were going to be in the background to people that were going to be in the foreground and had to learn how to deal with that pressure, how to deal with the media, understand um, that when a reporter asks you a question, you can tell them, what you want to say, not necessarily what they want you to say. That's a, that's a process that you have to learn. Um, so I think that, that the spotlight was challenging. You know, Being in court the first day, I was actually the first one up for testimony. That was challenging. Um, but I think that uh, once, you, once we got through that and had a, a better comfort level with it, and it was, again, it was like one of those things where we could all go through it together and bounce things off each other. And, uh, and help each other with, with that regard. And the other part of the question was? Just when you felt particularly empowered representing our community? Winning. You know, I mean, I think that, I, I think it, it really came down to winning and realizing what we were doing was resonating. It was resonating in LA, in San Francisco, and across the country, and hopefully, and we were hopeful the world. That, that just that the, our stories being out there were the stories of everyone that was fighting the same fight. So that's where the, the, the pride from the empowerment came from was, was knowing that we were doing the right thing, we were saying the right thing, and we were winning because of it. Jeff likes to win, <laughs> no doubt. Um, I'll just tell a quick story. Um, the empowerment for me came actually after the final win at the Supreme Court, because I didn't allow myself, you can ask Jeff, I played devil's advocate for four and a half years. And if was I was wrong every I time. I was wrong every time because I wanted to be devil's advocate, because <laughs> I kept asking everyone else to put on our shoes, walk a mile in our shoes, and then come back to me and tell me that we don't deserve the same rights that you do. And so I felt I had to do the same to the opposition. I was always like, they're going to come up with something. They have to come up with something, because that's the only way that this will make sense. And they never did. So winning is always great. But the story is, post-Supreme uh, Court when we went to San Francisco, and we were involved in the gay pride parade there. And afterward, we were in City Hall. And Jeff is like, I have to go pee. We have to find a restroom right now. And so we ran downstairs because he likes to win. Life under scrutiny. Yeah. <laughs> Jeff, Jeff I always a, have to Jeff's, yeah. Jeff's bladder is about that. Yeah. Um, that's like what we call an overshare. Now you know. Um, and I get really bad car sickness. That was always an issue throughout everything, too. Because when we all got in the van together, I needed to be in the front with Chad because we both get car sick. Yeah. And Sandy with the skirt on had to get in the back <laughs> for four and a half years. But she always wore really good shoes. Um, so we were, sta we were trying to find a restroom in City Hall, and there was a bunch of glass doors that were kind of, you know, they, had, they were partitioned off, and they said, do not enter, do not enter, do not enter. We, we entered. 
um, <laughs> because we knew the bathrooms were on the other side. And we stumbled into a room, and Jeff was hurrying, and I said, stop, 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 hang on, look around. Everyone's getting married. And it was, it's emotional to even think about it, because that was the moment for me where I felt, wow, we did something really cool. Because look at that little boy and his two dads. Look at those women getting married with their mom standing there. And I don't know, it was, a, it was two minutes of incredible like breathing. We just had to breathe in that moment. And in that moment, I thought, we are this big in this process because this is what it's about. It's about allowing people to have happiness. And I remembered in that moment what Ted Olson said. It's like, it's like happy people. It's making people happy. That was what it was about. So every challenge that came washed away. Every worry washed away. In that moment, it was like nothing mattered because look at everyone around us right now. Chris and Sandy. I, I had a unique situation when we filed the case, which was that I had been appointed by Governor Schwarzenegger, and I was still sitting in that position. <laughs> and um, I would report to work, and I really was not getting the greatest reception um, for the, the years I spent there. I did eventually leave that position. but. I was in a very odd situation of being Perry and Perry v. Schwarzenegger and working with that administration and running an organization that was advocating for children. And the campaign had based all of its rhetoric on how someone like me would be harmful to children. And so I was in a really odd point in my life of reconciling my professional identity and my identity as a plaintiff. And um, was not treated very well at work, I'm sorry to say. I wish I had been treated a little differently by the majority of people. There were definitely people that were wonderful. Um, so that was interesting. And then we also have a unique challenge in that we are parents, and Sandy and I have four sons. When we were asked by Chad to consider being plaintiffs, they were in middle school and high school and almost in, in one was already gone. In college. Yeah. So we had to track them down and sit them down and ask them each individually, would you be okay? Would you, do you understand? What does this mean to you? And you know, a 13-year-old or an 18-year-old just can barely wrap their head around some of these complexities that have been shared with you about the process, the risks, um, the good, the bad. And we did our very best to explain it to them. And they all said, absolutely, positively, we hope you do it. But over four years, um, they grew into men. Um, they had to identify as separate and autonomous beings from this case, which is like trying to not orbit the sun. Um, <laughs> and I, they all did it, and they had to do it in different ways. Um, you know, they had to remain individuals and be supportive, and I think that's an incredible challenge when you're an adolescent. And so we have, you know, we did a lot to try to keep them feeling okay about how much they didn't have us, how much they had to share us, how much they had to share their lives with it. And then, so my empowered moment was, um, and now is, where I think my, now my jumping off point is, how these two things really do intersect. My passion for early childhood education and human development and the LGBT movement and how they're so much the same. They're so much about potential and unlocking and unleashing everybody's potential. And there are kids, of course, growing up in this world with out first world problems like, do I get to go to the Supreme Court or not, and what will I wear? <laughs> um, it's really different. They're suffering for all kinds of economic reasons and other kinds of discrimination, and that had been my focus for 25 years. And getting to be a plaintiff in the case I think has, gives me an opportunity to talk to people like you about you should also be thinking about groups of people that are very young who will grow up in a world where hopefully this is resolved, but lots of other things aren't. And it's all about human potential and the transformation of um, individuals from feeling oppressed to feeling empowered. Um, so what I want to just briefly share is um, kind of where I come from and then what the experience was like and some of the real highs. So I, I grew up on a farm in Iowa, not the most common way in the world to grow up these days, who knew? Um, 
And that's a very kind of conservative background. So one of the challenges along the way with the case for me was having this large, wonderful family who had, you know, on some level were somewhat you know, fairly liberal, but really very private, and knowing that it was awkward for some of them to have me involved in the case, and trying to maintain relationships with them and be supportive and help move them along and not be angry or too disappointed. And over time, you know, just working through it with you know, sometimes fairly close relatives and just what that's like. But it really helped me understand and feel a certain level of empathy even with different voters or with different people and, and where they come from. And I saw within my own family and people I love, uh, people really move over four years from having a very difficult time with it um, just to getting to a point where they could see it more as a, as a positive thing. Like I, at one point I said to my mom, you know, I know this is hard for you um, and you feel self-conscious, but if you could shift to feeling proud, wouldn't that be a lovely thing? If, you, if instead of feeling like, what are the church ladies going to think, you could feel like what I'm doing is going to help people have better lives then you could feel proud and embrace that and still hold on to the religious beliefs that are important to you, and that's fine, and honor those. So that was an area that, for me, just took a lot of personal growth um, and, to, and patience. And I'm not finished with growing the patience, because I, <laughs> but I'm working on it, you know. Um, and then, but some of the moments then that were, for me, really fantastic were just the times when we were in places, public settings typically, where I saw gay people, and I, I know that... Um, there are different levels of development. Either they were younger, younger people, like in the gay pride parade, or um, when we got married, uh, you know, older people who were serious, you could tell they just had difficult lives. And I've always felt like Chris and I are pretty lucky. You know, life has treated us reasonably well. We've been able to be educated and we're healthy and we have families that loved us and took care of us. And we got to grow up in, in nurturing environments. That's a privilege, not everybody has that. Um, and there were times that we saw people like on the parade route after we got married, the San Francisco parade that was such a, so much fun, I could see people I thought, you're broken or you're vulnerable, and I really relate to those people. And I felt like, I, I felt so happy that we could be involved in something that would help other people have better lives because so many people, um, just basics of life are a huge struggle. I mean, I saw old people in wheelchairs and who are gay, and I just thought, oh, I'm so glad we're able to do something that hopefully helps you in your life. And when we were at the Gay Pride Parade, we saw these young, you know, uh, before the decision, before anybody, before we became celebrities um, in California. Um, and Chris and I were watching all these beautiful young kids, and I said, aren't they, aren't they beautiful, these young kids and they're marching along and they aren't going to have to have this fight. They're going to have a better world. And, and that was always the fun thing, just feeling like we're helping people who don't know who we are, they don't need to know who we are, hallelujah that they don't know who we are, but wanting to help them. And as parents, we always kind of had that feeling of like, it's our obligation to help other people. Like you, you have to help other people raise their kids. It's the right thing to do. You have to boss those kids around when they're not <laughs> behaving, right? It's our job. And I felt like we did our job in terms of helping make the world a little bit better for our future generations. Yeah. Natalia. Um, well, my second question is for the panel at large, but maybe a little bit more geared towards the lawyers. Um, I believe that for the first time, law firms, as opposed to LGBT impact litigation nonprofits, had a major role in bringing impact litigation cases for the LGBT movement. Um, not only were they counsel for these two cases, many of them coordinated amicus briefs, and yet others have litigated other cases on LGBT issues, such as conversion therapy. So what, in your opinion, precipitated this change? And what relationship do you envision between law firms and LGBT impact litigation nonprofits in the future? I'm not going to take that one. Yeah. <laughs> All right. The non-lawyer up here. Um, look, uh, the, the reason um, that this case was filed in the way uh, that it was was because it's hard to think back now. You know, there are over 30 federal cases uh, as it relates to marriage now today in this country. When Prop 8 passed, there were zero. Um, and decisions had been made for, for very good reason by, by incredibly smart people for whom we all stand on their shoulders today. 
Um, but a decision had been made not to file a federal case. Um, and we chose, Edie made reference to that uh, in her case when, when she spoke to some of them. Um, and so I was well aware um, of, of folks in the movement and, and their views. Um, as we started vetting the idea of this case, and I talked to folks like Ted Olson and David Boys and, and a number of other people who I knew uh, would disagree, um, a small group of us listened to everyone uh, on all sides um, and then ultimately made the decision. Uh, and we made the decision uh, knowing that there's no guarantee to win. Um, but we knew that if we didn't move forward and if we didn't file a case, there was certainly no chance that we would win. Um, and after listening to everyone uh, on all sides, um, our team uh, and these plaintiffs uh, made a decision that uh, we would be moving forward and filing uh, a federal case. And um, there was um, a lot of disagreement, both privately as well as publicly, and I tried to take on most of that uh, myself so that our legal teams as well um, as our uh, communications team that ran the public awareness campaign for the five years that this case rose uh, could really focus on the job of executing this case with as close to perfection as possible in the courtroom as well as in the court of public opinion. Um, and so I spent much of my time, particularly in those early days, um, uh, of spending time with those um, for whom I had great respect um, and, and who disagreed with us. But ultimately, um, once this case was filed, uh, we worked very hard to all come together uh, and all be on the same page once it's filed to say that now our job is to work together uh, and to do the best we can to coordinate and to collaborate uh, and, to, uh, and to share uh, ideas. Um, now, today, and in the course of that case, there are, uh, as I call them, the children of Perry. Um, there are lawsuits after lawsuit, as you all know, that were filed, that have now been filed in states all across this country, um, including a case called the Bostic case uh, that was filed uh, in Virginia some time ago, and we just announced two weeks ago uh, that Ted Olson and David Boys would be joining that case uh, as co-counsel uh, in the Bostic case uh, as it rise, as it rose. So the media really enjoyed some of the disagreement, um, but quite frankly, uh, most all of us uh, who were in the movement, even when the media was focused on it, we were having you know private meetings and conversations where we were talking about how we could work together. Um, and, and much was made about that uh, in the press. Uh, but again, once it was filed, we were all on the same page and we were all working together because then everyone had an interest uh, in winning that case. So that's why um, we used um, private counsel. We used the two law firms of, of Ted Olson and David Boys uh, to execute that case. Um, and again, in the Bostic case, uh, we are working with both of these law firms. AFER is working with both of these law firms. Um, as co-counsel uh, in the Bostic case. Now, many of these other cases uh, have been filed uh, by the brilliant legal advocacy groups that got us um, as far as we are today. Make no mistake about it, without the work of, of Single A GLAD, Lambda Legal, ACLU, and many others, this movement would not be where it is today. We wouldn't have had the environment uh, that we needed uh, in order to win this case and in order to win uh, the, the Windsor case. Um, and so today, as a community, uh, we're all one and we all uh, work together. And I suppose um, that there will continue to be uh, a great mix, um, e even in those cases that are litigated um, by the LGBT uh, groups, oftentimes there is private counsel that they partner with uh, in each of those cases and in each uh, of, of those regions. Um, can I focus on a different aspect of the question that you were asking, um, just make an observation and then uh, a point about it. The observation is, at least in the DOMA context, it was a complete fortuity of timing that the case the Supreme Court took was E.D. Windsor's. There were uh, at least four major cases going on that were challenges to DOMA, and I think the reason the Supreme Court took E.D.'s case rather than the other cases is in part uh, a matter of accident. That is, that Justice Kagan would have been recused from what people thought of for a long time as the leading case, the Gill case from uh, the First Circuit, because she had participated in that case when she was in the Solicitor General's office, and nobody wanted a 4-4 tie at the Supreme Court. So that case uh, dropped out of the picture. 
There was then a second leading case, the Galinsky case from California challenging DOMA. Uh, and both of these cases were brought, um, uh, I think Galinsky was brought by Lambda Legal and uh, Gill was brought by GLAAD. And the real kind of architect of the movement to attack uh, DOMA was Mary Bonato at GLAAD. And so uh, Gill dropped out of kind of the leading contender because of the tie issue. Uh, the government then wanted the Galinsky case as the case the Supreme Court would hear on the issue. It turned out after the fact, we found out Justice Kagan recused from that as well because when certiorari was denied in that case, uh, she did not participate. Then the government said the case it would really like was a case called Peterson uh, from Connecticut. But what happened there is that case was still stuck in the Court of Appeals at the point at which uh, a panel in the Second Circuit fast-tracked Edie's case. So Edie's case was the only case both decided by the Court of Appeals and in which Justice Kagan could sit that was available when the Supreme Court decided it wanted to hear the Perry case and a DOMA case together. That, and, and that's how the case got, uh, got to be the lead case on the DOMA issue. It was, it was not because it was a decision by private firms versus the um, uh, organized LGBT bar. Um, that being said, one of the most interesting things to me about law firms in the context of the, the two cases at the Supreme Court were, I think between the two cases, maybe 110 amicus briefs were filed. I mean, there was a huge number of amicus briefs. And virtually none of the briefs on the other side in either case was filed by a major law firm. All of the major law firms came in on the side uh, of marriage equality. And just as strikingly, you may remember that when Paul Clement first agreed to defend uh, DOMA on behalf of the House of Representatives. He was working for a major uh, American law firm. And the firm was so embarrassed internally by his decision to take this case on that they tried to get out of it, leading him uh, to resign from the firm and take the case with him uh, to the new firm he's, he's now at, which has many fewer conflicts because it really only has uh, five or six uh, major lawyers uh, at the firm. But the interesting thing here is it's the same generational point I was making before, which is major law firms uh, uh, reflect the society in which they live, and that's a society in which their clients, which are major corporations, are largely committed to the idea of equality for LGBT employees. It's a world in which their associates and their younger partners uh, grew up in a legal system and at law schools where uh, equality and non-discrimination were taken uh, for granted, in which the law schools fought the Solomon Amendment for as long as they could and then engaged in a variety of forms of resistance afterwards. And so it's not a surprise in that sense that law firms, if they're going to be involved in issues involving the LGBT community, are almost entirely going to be on the side of uh, marriage equality and non-discrimination because of the kind of people who are at the firms and uh, the uh, public relations disaster for the firms uh, if they come in on the other side of the issue. I mean, it really was striking how many of the briefs that were filed on the other side were both bad in the way that Jeremy was talking about and filed by people you had never heard of. Uh, just one amusing story along these lines, which is, and um, Michael Baer, who was on the team with me, will remember this. The Saturday, the Supreme Court granted certiorari on uh, Friday, on a December 7th. Um, and uh, on Saturday morning, we got the first email uh, from somebody asking to come into the case and participate as an amicus because you have to ask for the party's approval, um, uh, at least ask for it. And it was the Westboro Baptist Church. Uh, and Robbie Kaplan said to me, well, what do we do about this? And I said, say yes. <laughs> I mean, the best thing for us is for the Supreme Court to see who are the people on the other side of this issue. Um, and so uh, that, was, that was an exciting moment for everyone. <laughs> we and find I'm, ourselves in the, oh, the, the any. I was just going to add that um, I was part of the amicus effort with Mary Bonato and, uh, and Jeremy and others, and it was an incredible effort, but on that corporation's brief that was filed by over, it was 100 companies, and we're talking about blue chip American companies of all stripes, not just Silicon Valley and you know California companies, but we had so many companies that wanted to join that brief that there were requests pouring in you know, days after we filed. And I was getting emails from people at companies saying, is there still time to join? Is there still time to join? And you know, they, they 
were so eager to be a part of it. And I think that's really, it shows the shift in public opinion over the four and a half years that it became, um, it, it became non-controversial to be part of our team and, and in fact controversial to be on the other side and no one, no leading law firm, no leading company would stand up and say that they supported Proposition 8 or DOMA. So we are in the privileged position of having a few minutes for audience questions. And so if you're interested in asking anyone on the panel uh, a question, you can cue at either microphone and I'll go back and forth across the room. Suzanne. Thanks, Gary. Oh, that was just great. And I, you know, I've seen pictures of you guys, the plaintiffs, for a long time, but I haven't uh, heard you speak. And it was really wonderful to hear you speak. So thank you very much. Um, so I just have a question, actually, that follows up on yours. Law student, sorry, I don't remember your name. Natalia. 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 Um, and it's really uh, for Theane and Jeremy, which is, it, it, it follows directly because um, you both come from commercial litigation firms. You're both these fabulous commercial litigators. And as you said, Theane, when you first heard about the case being filed in federal court, you knew it was huge, right? And had huge upside, potentially, and huge risk associated with it. And then... But you hadn't, I, I mean, I don't, I don't actually know, I was talking to Jeremy about this, I don't th know that either of you had done a lot of gay rights work, litigation before. And so I'm curious because when the gay legal groups tried to intervene in the case, to be participants in the case, you all made the decision to block that, to oppose their motion to intervene, their request to come into the case. And I'm wondering now that uh, looking at that again, would you do the same thing again today? Why did you do it then? Would you do it again today? You know, one really important part of the case was the city of San Francisco, city and county of San Francisco. So um, they're not, not here with us today, but they intervened into the case and they had uh, substantial experience fighting for marriage equality in California. And they really did have that experience and that credibility and that track record. And they were in very helpful to us and worked side by side with us throughout the case. But it was very important for us to have, I mean, there were a lot of pieces in this case and there were um, a lot of strategic decisions to be made and there obviously were differences of opinion, I think internally, externally. Uh, it's very important as the lawyers, and you know, Chad said he was dealing with kind of more of the external relations, but for our legal team, it was really important for Ted and David to be able to set, you know, to decide the strategy and to litigate the case the way they wanted to. And for our team, I think in the end, we, we did informally very much cooperate and we welcome the participation and the help from um, from all of the groups and you know it was because of cases like Varnum and the litigation that had occurred in the states that we had records of expert testimony and we knew where to go and who to ask when we had questions but I think it was for us important to have the the ability to dictate the strategy but we did, we did very much look to others for, for input. Jeremy, did you want to? I think, I think that's probably everything I, I, would, I would have said as well. It's just, but, but I do want to emphasize the point. Um, I think there was a lot of suspicion at the beginning, and there, um, but we, we moved past that quickly. Um, and after Judge Walker, made his rulings on the various intervention motions, uh, we got together um, with attorneys from the various groups that wanted to uh, intervene. And we started talking right then and there. And we kept that conversation going throughout the litigation. And so I think we, we did learn from them and, and had a close relationship with them, notwithstanding um, you know, what was that, that fundamental disagreement at the beginning about um, how many, how many parties should be involved in the case. Other questions from the audience? So hi, I'm Kenji Yoshino. Um, thank you for a completely brilliant uh, panel. 
I guess I wanted to ask, I think there are going to be disparate answers about the time frame on Pam's question. So it starts with uh, lawyers on the other side where you decided to make a 50 state claim, right? So you kind of won my heart when you led with the marriage claim uh, because I think that this taps into the universality of the experience. But it's clearly an ambitious 50 state solution. And at every point in this litigation, you are quite stalwart about saying we're going for all 50 states. We're not, this is not a California limited solution. And I wanted to ask whether that was tactical because you knew you know, other options were on the table and so you might want to bargain down and if the Supreme Court wanted to bargain down, it could bargain down to the Ninth Circuit's one state solution or the government's eight state solution or whether or not that really came from a belief that you, this was a get, this was something that was possible for you. And then as a follow-up to that, maybe all the way down the line, when do you think it will, will get to 50, right? I mean, Pam said 50 years from now this will be resolved. I imagine that you think that it's going to be resolved a lot more quickly than that by the Supreme Court. So I just want to get the early betting on this. And Chad, as the head of HRC now, you know, what is your view on this? Well, I'll just um, start by saying if you've spoken at all or heard to Ted Olson or heard him speak, you will understand right away that he believes very deeply and very fundamentally that this is about the right to marry and that it's a fundamental liberty. And uh, so I think it, it came from him. And uh, I think if you also if you read Justice Kennedy's opinion in Windsor, it is very telling. When I read it, I was startled by how many times he mentioned the word dignity. And for me, when, when I read that, I think that he's speaking in that language. It's about dignity and uh, fundamental liberty. And if you look at his opinion in Lawrence, it speaks that same language. So that was what we tapped into in the very beginning. And, but again, it was a full menu of options for the court. They could go broad, they could go narrow. We had various scenarios under which we could win and we wanted to give them every option. And you're right, usually you don't win big the first time, but you lay the groundwork for the next time. Jeremy, and then we'll go down the line. Oh, no? So when's it resolved, Chad? Um, I, th I think uh, that we will have marriage equality in all 50 states in this country within the next five years. Um, if you look at where public opinion is uh, in this country, when the Supreme Court decided Loving v. Virginia in 1967, uh, Gallup did every decade uh, a public opinion test, um, and it was on the eighth year, 48, 58, 68. Um, that case was decided in 1967. In 1968, 74% of Americans disagreed with interracial marriage, 74%. Now, what they had, though, was the vast majority of states had already moved um, to, to remove those laws uh, from their books. You had uh, fewer than, by, by the time they decided the case, you had around 15, I think, uh, states that were left with such laws um, on the books. Um, you also have incredible movement as it relates to Republicans. Uh, we just released a series of bipartisan polls in southern states. Vast majority of Republicans in states like Arkansas, Mississippi, North Carolina, and Virginia, vast majority of Republicans under the age of 30 uh, support marriage equality. Prior to the filing of the Windsor case and the Prop 8 case, we moved about a point a year every single year. Um, if you look in the last five years, we've moved somewhere between, dependent upon uh, what group of polling you look at, between three and five points every year. Uh, we're in the upper 50s now uh, on our national numbers, um, and it won't be long till we'll be over 60. I would say we'll be over 60 probably in the next, uh, in the next couple of years. Um, you've probably been following uh, the New Jersey case um, that where th there's a brilliant Lambda legal case that we had all been waiting on um, that, those, uh, that decision. Um, and now that case is moving forward. It's going uh, directly uh, to the Supreme Court. Um, the stay was denied at lower court that had been requested by Governor Christie uh, in that state uh, is going to move forward. And I suspect soon we'll have marriage equality. Um, I also uh, believe that there are a number of states. If you look at where we and our partners, state partners and other national organizations are investing dollars right now uh, to get marriage equality uh, in the coming weeks for some, months for others, and in the next year to 18 months, uh, Hawaii, Illinois, Nevada, um, 
New Mexico, a whole host of states that we'll get very soon. Uh, but then you'll reach a wall. Um, there is a wall that we hit where you're not likely to get marriage equality at the ballot box or via the state legislature uh, in my home state of Arkansas or, or in Mississippi. Uh, but what we can do is continue to move public opinion at the rapid pace uh, that it has moved over these last four or five years. And then one or more of these cases will ultimately reach the Supreme Court. And I think um, Justice Kennedy's uh, opinion in the Windsor case is, is very clear and provides a lot of direction um, for, for those future cases. So I believe um, that within the next five years, uh, we'll have marriage equality in all 50 states in this country. And that should be our goal. And we should fight like hell uh, to ensure uh, that we can get there. So I, I think you're right. But just as a follow-up, Chad, but if I, if I might, you're, you're obviously brilliant at this, so I want to get you while I can. No, I'm not. Uh, so if we have the... Um, My mom says so. That's all, Kenji. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm with her. So if you have that, you know, like this, this kind of disconnect in between the number of states and the percentages in Loving, so I think it was 16 at the time when Loving versus Virginia was decided in 1967, but as you say, you know, the polling number was very much, you know, higher yeah. in terms of resisting. Why should we privilege polls over states? Is there no, I, a reason I, I don't why we think, would value I, one metric over the other? No, I don't think you, you can necessarily. It's just a difference of where this country is and where this country's headed. I think there's, a, there's another indicator, and that's the percentage of Americans that will be living in marriage states. I think in the next couple of years, we will reach um, a point where a majority of Americans live in states uh, with marriage equality. So there are a number of indicators that will continue, uh, continue this momentum. And look, if we didn't have the evidence um, over, uh, over these last few years as to where states are headed and where public opinion is headed, or if we didn't have the opinion, uh, the brilliant opinion uh, in the Windsor case written by, by Justice Kennedy, I think there might be uh, room uh, for more questioning in terms of, in, in terms of the pace at which uh, we'll get there. Um, but, but I'm, uh, look, I, again, I acknowledge from the beginning in full disclosure, I'm, I'm the non-lawyer. Um, that, that's part of this team, but, but I do believe, uh, if you look at these cases, I think it's something like 34 or 35, um, Pam, you probably know the exact number of cases that are pending, which yeah, includes God. a couple of divorce cases. Could be yesterday's number. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> um, every day there are new cases uh, that, uh, that are filed, so it, it's well over 30 cases. One or many of these cases are gonna reach the court, you're gonna have, um, you're gonna have differing opinions, um, that will present conflict um, for, for cases uh, to rise. Now, obviously, the Supreme Court can choose to take a case or, and, and hold the case, or they can choose uh, to deny cert and let lower court uh, victories or losses stand. Um, but again, once you start having more of these, if you have circuit court victories, then you have a group of states that have marriage equality, and it, it's going to become an unbearable situation in this country, and I think it would be very difficult to wait a lot more uh, than five years. Um, and look, I, I think it's important to set the goalposts because if you don't set them, you'll never reach them. Absolutely. So let's go down uh, the line. Can I just make one observation about this? Sure. Which is, Loving was a unanimous decision. There is no way in the next five years this will be a unanimous decision. There's no way in the next 20 years this will be a unanimous decision at the Supreme Court. And so one of the real questions is, five years from now, if we have the current Supreme Court and they decide the issue, I'm pretty confident that they would decide it in favor of marriage equality. But five years from now, we could have a very different Supreme Court than we have right now. And it could be a Supreme Court in which, uh, you know, John Roberts is the median voter on the Supreme Court. And that's a very different court and will decide the case in a very different way. And I mean, I think that adds some urgency to trying to either get the decision from the Supreme Court very soon after now or to, or, or perhaps a, a longer term strategy because- Or, or to win the 2016 presidential yeah, election. Yeah, right, right. right, well there's that too. But, but I do, th but the Even current Scalia Supreme Court's can't total, live forever. What, Edie, Edie, yeah, Edie could get married again. She could move, she could move to Arkansas and get married. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, let's go down the line and, and give us your best guess of when you think it's all said and done. Well, um, oh, I, I, I might. Oh, yeah. um, my vote's always with Ted Olson because one thing I learned during our experience is that Ted seems to always be right when it comes to legal strategy. So my vote is four years, and I think in four years, somebody will be on a, uh, doing an interview in front of the Supreme Court, and they'll get a call from Hillary Clinton on Air Force One congratulating them, and I <laughs> hope I get to witness that. <laughs> Chris. I'll double down. I'll go with Sandy's prediction. 
I love Sandy's prediction as well. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm, a, I'm a man that will always follow Chad Griffin. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would, I would, uh, I don't know if we should be in the business of, you know, prognosticating that as as layman's, but with the brilliant lawyers that we have out there fighting, and that man right there, right there, he will lead us to marriage equality. And if he says five years, I would put my money on five years. Natalia, bet your le your future legal career on this. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go with five years as well. Yeah. <laughs> Done. Great. Thank you all. And with that, I'm going to ask the audience for two, um, two rounds of applause. The first is for Pam Carlin in the Stanford Legal Clinic, Jeremy Goldman and Boy Schiller and Flexner, uh, Theonay Evangelis and um, Gibson Dunn. Uh, please thank the legal teams for the work that they've done. And secondly, for Chad Griffin and the folks at AFER, and most importantly, for Edie Windsor in her absence, and Chris and Sandy uh, and Jeff and Paul, please thank these people. It's very rare that you get to be on a stage with people who are actually uh, maybe heroes, and I appreciate their work. <laughs> This symposium will reconvene tomorrow morning at 9.30 in 190 Law. Thank you all and good night. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.